Good afternoon, everybody. All right, today we are going to take the proteins that we made last time and assemble them into virus particles. We're going to talk about some general principles of virus assembly uh, using a couple of selected examples as usual. Now, all viruses, all virions, have to undergo a set of reactions to, to be formed. And these are outlined here. Many of them are in common. The yellow ones on this slide are in common uh, to all viruses. For example, you have to make a, all the individual structural units from viral proteins. The, the viral proteins assemble into structural units. You make a shell in some cases. But some cases, during budding, you're not really making a shell till later, so this is not always the right order. You have to get nucleic acids into the particle, right? This is an important part of virus assembly. If you can't put nucleic acids in there, the infection will not spread to the next, shell, uh, next cell, obviously. In some cases, the vir virus particles get an envelope. That's the blue one here. It's blue because not all viruses are enveloped, of course. Uh, and then um, you have to be released from the host cell. Now, sometimes release occurs before maturation or is concomitant with. Sometimes maturation occurs first and then the virions are, are released from the host cell. So <coughs> these steps can vary in their order, but they're all steps that viruses have to undergo. And as you know from what we've talked about so far in this course, there are quite a few different kinds of virion particles, although we did arrange them into very specific groups like icosahedral particles with or without an envelope, uh, without an envelope for example, or, or with envelopes. Uh, viruses with helical genomes, helical symmetry, and of course among the animal viruses all of those have envelopes. And if you just look at the structure of these viruses, you should be able to know how it's assembled as we'll see today. How it gets into a new cell, an envelope virus with a, with a membrane that has to fuse somewhere in the cell versus an icosahedral shell, and also how it uh, begins to replicate. Now here's an example of what structure can't really tell us. And that's a comparison of tupacornaviruses, poliovirus, and rhinovirus. Uh, and they have very similar particles. The two particles are shown here. You know, can you see any difference between those two? No? Yeah, there, there's some subtle differences. But the point is that they're they're quite similar. In fact, the amino acid sequences are very similar. Uh, the genome is similar in size. The capsid <coughs> looks the same, yet they have really different biological properties. Poliovirus enters the gut. We, we ingest these viruses. They pass through our stomach on their way to the intestine, which is where they will replicate. So they're resistant to extremes of pH, the low pH of the stomach, the higher pH beyond that, and all the digestive en enzymes that it encounters. On the other hand, rhinoviruses, uh, when they do enter the stomach, they get taken apart by the low pH. So they are completely susceptible to low pH. Uh, rhinoviruses are respiratory pathogens where the pH isn't low, of course, but occasionally you do swallow them. That's part of our defense system, is that there's a, an elevator, a mucociliary elevator in our respiratory tract that brings up virus and mucus, and then it, you, you swallow it where it gets digested. It doesn't sound very nice, but in fact, that's a good defense system. Or you could spit it out, I suppose, but most of the time we do swallow it. And when this virus finds itself in the gut, it's inactivated. So here we are, two viruses that look, for all purposes, exactly the same, yet there are a few amino acid differences in the capsid that confer this biological difference. So I don't want you to think that just because it's an icosahedral virus that it has certain properties. Now, one thing that you have to remember is that all of the particles we're going to talk about have to be metastable. That is, they have to survive in the wild, whether the wild be, you know, the gut tract or the respiratory tract, but they do have to come apart during infection. This is a concept we talked about uh, during the entry lecture, metastability, stable under some conditions and unstable under others. Now, assembly is interesting. Assembly happens in a cell, and as you'll see in a few moments, there's a pathway of assembly for all viruses. Uh, 
So things happen in a certain order. And this is typically not reversible in the cell where the virions are being made. But when these new virions reach a new infecting cell, then their stability goes away. They can, that assembly pattern can be reversed. So this tells you right away that the, where the virus is assembling in the cell is very different from where it is when it enters a new cell. The conditions are different such that in the assembly cell, assembly is irreversible for all, parts, for all intents and purposes, uh, but reversible in the infecting cell. So just keep remembering that when we talk about this assembly pathway. <coughs> Like every other aspect of viral replication, assembly also depends exceedingly on the host. Now, the, the virions encode structural proteins, and for the most part, uh, all the proteins, or the vast majority of proteins in virions are virus encoded. There are very few exceptions. Yet, the virus requires cell functions to put them together into a nice virion. For example, many Many of the virion proteins have to fold properly. They need cellular chaperones to help them to fold properly. Otherwise, they don't fold in the right way. Cellular transport systems move proteins and nucleic acids to where they need to be in order to form a new virion. As I said earlier, these things just don't diffuse around in the cell. They're actively transported. And we know that from experiments where we use inhibitors of transport. So those transport systems are essential. Secretory pathway is also important for viruses that have glycoproteins or anything that moves through the ER and the Golgi. That has to go through the secretory pathway. And finally, you already know that many viruses replicate in the nucleus. Today we'll see that many of those also assemble. So you have to be able to get in the nucleus and of course get back out again. And that depends on the import and export machinery. So all of these are very complicated processes, and the virus could never encode one of them for, for themselves unless they were very complex, in which case they wouldn't be viruses anymore. <clears throat> Nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. This reminds me of a saying in a BSL-4, which is a high containment facility where you have to wear a spacesuit to work on viruses. Nothing happens fast in a BSL-4. Um, you have to be concentrated to assemble quickly in a cell or with reasonable speed. And so this is actually achieved in a variety of ways, concentrating viral components so assembly occurs in a reasonable amount of time. And this leads to sometimes visible bodies in the cell, which we often call inclusions. So that's one way of speeding up assembly to make these inclusions. Sometimes they're called factories, in the case of vaccinia virus and a few others. Uh, and here on the lower right is an example of such an inclusion body. This is a neuron in an, in an individual unfortunate to have been infected with rabies virus. And um, the cytoplasm of this cell has these very distinct sort of round structures. And these are factories where rabies virions are being assembled. So again, the point is you want to concentrate all the components in one place so reactions go faster. And uh, in many cases, these inclusion bodies form something that you can see in a light microscope, which is how this photograph was taken. And they're given names. So many years ago, people would discover them. And then the, the pathologist, typically, who discovered them got to name them. So these are called Negri bodies. And if you see Negri bodies in, the, in a neuron, uh, it's quite likely that that individual has uh, rabies. So a lot of these are what we call pathonomic for infection. That is, if you see these in certain cells, they are pretty typical of certain virus infections. Um, other ways of concentrating proteins include using membranes within the cell. You may remember that poliovirus replicates its RNA on vesicles that it induces in the cell on the surface of these vesicles. You may say, why on the surface of a vesicle? Well, it's probably more concentrated than having all the components floating around in the cytoplasm needing to run into one another. So you do it on a vesicle where everything is happening. So those are, that's what I'm talking about when I say concentrating components for assembly. How do we do this? How do we get to a certain place in the cell so we can be concentrated and assemble more efficiently? Well, one way is to do it in a compartment a factory or some localized site. So those Negri bodies were localized sites. 
And we don't really understand how viruses form these for the most part. There are some, some clues, but uh, we don't know what makes a particle go to one place. Probably a protein or several proteins nucleates the formation of a factory and then it simply grows. Uh, sometimes you have localized production of proteins. And as I said, a single protein is made, then you have protein-protein interactions and it attracts more proteins and that makes uh, uh, a factory. And you can also make sub-assemblies, as we'll see, of, of uh, individual proteins which then join to form the virion. Also, the membrane pr plays a role, as we've seen for RNA synthesis. Um, structural components often line up right under a membrane. We'll see that a bit later. And you get interactions, protein-protein interactions that help to form uh, an individual virion. And this leads to so-called membrane patches where you can actually see before viruses leave a cell. So we'll see later, vi many viruses leave the cell by this process called budding. And just before a bud forms, you, you can see right beneath the membrane uh, a patch where there are viral proteins that are being accumulated. So they're being directed to this very one specific part of the plasma membrane. So th throughout all our discussion, we're not going to make much reference to transport. But remember, all this movement that we're talking about requires energy. It requires typically uh, the, the motor proteins of the cytoskeleton. And we talked about this for virus particles getting into the cell, whether it's a naked virus or an endosome moving from the plasma membrane towards the nucleus, that requires movement along microtubules. And it's the same for components for assembly. They have to go towards the nucleus or away from the nucleus uh, on these tracks. Uh, so this is long-range transport that requires energy. Now this movement, besides all the characteristics that I've told you about, uh, this movement is facilitated by addresses built into viral proteins. So for example, you, you know, of course, all about signal sequences <coughs> that direct membrane proteins to the membranes through the ER and the Golgi to the plasma membrane. Uh, there are also fatty acid modifications that we'll talk about later that help send proteins uh, to the membrane. There are retention signals that keep proteins in certain places. If you want a protein to stay in the ER, you have an ER retention signal on the protein. So some viruses actually bud from the ER so they would have these signals. Nuclear localization signals for proteins that need to get in the nucleus. Uh, nuclear export signals if you need to get out. Uh, and finally, again, we'll we come back to microtubules and filaments as ways of, of moving uh, proteins around. So these are clearly involving protein, viral protein interactions with the motor system. And much of that remains to be sorted out. So here's just an example of nuclear localization. And again, it's something that most of you are likely familiar with. We have a cell infected with a virus needs to replicate in the nucleus. And here, there are three examples shown here, uh, influenza virus, polyomavirus, and an adenovirus. So influenza virus, you remember, replicates its genome in the nucleus and it starts to assemble the ribonucleoprotein there. Uh, so the nucleoprotein, which is a component of that RNP, is made in the cytoplasm on free ribosomes and it gets shipped into the nucleus the nuclear protein has a nuclear localization signal, a very short amino acid sequence that specifies to the transport apparatus I need to go in there, and that's how it's taken up. The same for other viral proteins that need to get in the nucleus. Here we have some structural proteins of polyoma or adenovirus uh, needing to get in the nucleus because their DNA, the DNA of these viruses is replicated there, and the virus is going to be assembled in the nucleus why is not clear, but I, I suppose it makes sense to assemble the particles where you've replicated the DNA genome. So these capsid proteins also have nuclear localization signals that specify them uh, for import. So that's an example of getting the viral structural proteins to the right place in the cell using these kinds of addresses. In the same way, many viral glycoproteins, remember envelope viruses have glycoproteins in their membranes. Those are typical uh, proteins made in the secretory pathway. So they're made on the rough ER, shown here, the ribosomes all bound to the outside of the ER. Uh, the, the protein is translated through into the lumen of the ER, typical uh, membrane glycoproteins. Uh, and then the glycoprotein needs to go to the surface where it will eventually participate in, in budding of the virion. And to get there, it goes through the secretory pathway. It moves from the ER 
through the various stacks of the Golgi by vesicular transport, and then eventually up to the surface in a vesicle, in a secretory vesicle, and that vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, and now we have um, a viral glycoprotein at the cell surface. And this is going to serve as a nucleation point for other structural proteins that need to be incorporated into these particles. So you can see here other viral proteins are joining it. And look, these, the movement of these secretory vesicles, again, requires microtubules, transport from one place to the other. So here's an example of the need for a, the microtubules in the movement of a viral protein. This is a cell infected with vesicular stomatitis virus, that, that bullet-shaped virus related to rabies virus. And remember, its RNA genome is, is packaged as, as a helical nucleocapsid. The RNA is bound to nucleoprotein, the NP. There's one copy of this protein repeated many times uh, across the length of the RNA. And this is an infected cell, as I said. The nucleus is stained red. <coughs> The microtubules are stained, sorry, that's blue, not red. <laughs> the nucleus is stained blue. The uh, microtubules are stained red. And the viral nucleoprotein is, is stained green. So you can see in the top panel, this is just an infected cell untreated. These nucleoproteins are moving uh, towards, uh, from the periphery, uh, sorry, from around the nucleus towards the plasma membrane. So they're moving there. Uh, by transport on microtubules. They're going to make it to the plasma membrane and eventually be incorporated into new virions. If you treat these cells with nocotazole, it's a drug that disrupts microtubules. That's shown in the bottom. You see now the nucleoprotein is all accumulating in patches. It's not going anywhere. So wherever it's made, it's just accumulating and aggregating. So this shows you one bit of evidence that you need these microtubules to bring the nucleoprotein to where it needs to be, which in this case is the uh, plasma membrane. So making a subassembly is another way to concentrate all of your viral proteins that you need to use to build a, a particle. So let's look at a couple of ways to, to make subassemblies. One way is that you can make individual proteins and they will assemble. Remember, the structural proteins of viruses have built within them the information to interact with each other. They'll fold properly, and then they will interact and form the structures. That's, that's been selected by many years of evolution. So here are two examples of assembly from uh, individual protein molecules. <coughs> we have uh, SV40, the polyomavirus, where the uh, subunit of the capsid, remember these are icosahedral capsids that we're building here. Here is a pentamer made up of five copies of VP1 and a copy of VP2 slash VP3, the green protein in the middle. And these are simply translated as independent proteins. VP1 is made on its own and it folds up into this form that's eventually going to be part of the pentamer and VP23 is also made independently. And they associate to form pentamers which then go on to film to form the capsid. So this is what I mean by a subassembly. It's not the whole capsid, but it's more than just one of the proteins. Uh, here is adenovirus, just another example of assembly from individual protein molecules. Here we're making a penton with a, a fiber attached to it, and these are at each of the five-fold axes of symmetry. It's what give adenovirus that satellite-type look. Uh, the fiber is made from one protein that's translated and trimerizes. Uh, the, the penton base is made from a single protein, again, that associates five of them associate to form the penton base, and then the fiber and the penton base associate. So again, you make individual polypeptides, they fold properly, and then they assemble with each other to form a subassembly. And again, you can imagine that this happens better when you have a lot of these proteins in one area. <coughs> okay, so that's making individual proteins. Not all viruses do that. Other viruses make precursors. Remember, the polyprotein strategy is a good way of making several proteins from one mRNA. We have this restriction in eukaryotic cells, one mRNA, one protein. One way around it is the polyprotein. So here's poliovirus, which makes a very long polyprotein spanning the whole genome and then processes it with proteases. And here we're looking at the way the capsid protein is formed. So we translate what is the first third of the genome, essentially, called the P1 region. And that encodes the four capsid proteins, VP1, 2, 3, and 4. 
So these are made, they're released from the polyprotein as soon as the right protease is made that can clip it and release it. And when it's released, it then folds properly here, it folded P1. See, VP1, 2, and 3 begin to associate in the structure that will eventually make its way into the virion. Then the uh, loops are cut by the protease again, and that gives us the final structural unit, which will then get uh, incorporated into virions, as we'll see later. So that's just a polyprotein strategy, again, where the, the proteins are being cleaved by viral proteases. In some cases, we need chaperones. This, uh, that was on an earlier slide. The virus uses proteins from the cell, and one of them is our chaperones that help maintain the proper folding uh, of uh, the viral proteins. Now, these can be cellular chaperones or viral, and here we're showing an example of a viral chaperone. That is, uh, the hexon protein is made by translation of the, of the appropriate mRNA, uh, and then a viral chaperone, the, the L400 kilodalton protein, associates into a trimer to um, form the, the, the hexon trimer that will get put into the virion. So those are just a couple of ways of um, making sub-assemblies. Now when viruses do um, assemble, they often, they typically follow very specific steps. You can almost look at it as a uh, assembly line for a car, and things are added as the, as the growing car moves down the line. So here's an example of that kind of sequential assembly for poliovirus. So this is actually the entire cycle of infection, but what we should focus on here is the translation of the polyprotein from the viral mRNA. We just looked at this in some detail. The P1 protein uh, is made, it's cleaved, it forms a structural unit. This is called a 5S structural unit because in the old days we used to measure big, big protein assemblies <coughs> by how fast they move through a sucrose gradient and the, the measurement of that speed was an S unit, a Svedberg unit. So this has stuck, even though few people do these uh, gradients anymore. So this is a 5S structural unit. It then, uh, five of these associate to form a pentamer, right? Pentamer is nothing more than five of these 5S structural units. And again, the information for assembly into a pentamer is built into the 5S. When there are enough of these in the same area of the cell, they will spontaneously assemble into a pentamer. Uh, the pentamers then join with genomic RNA, and the RNA, of course, is made by replication in a process that we talked about some time ago. And this is, of course, happening later in infection. And now you have a capsid formed by putting 12 um, pentamers together with the genomic RNA. And now you have a complete virion, which is almost ready to go, except it needs another cleavage, and that is the final one between uh, the last two capsid proteins, VP4 and VP2, and finally it's an infectious particle and it gets released from the cell. So that's an example of sequential assembly. You make a, a series of structural intermediates that proceed to the virion. Yes? When it makes the pentamer, does that count as a combination of, so first it's the, the precursor and then it makes the um, individual protein molecules, so like you said there's three ways of making a sub-assembly. Right. Well, this is, a, yeah, these are certainly sub-assemblies. So the 5S is a sub-assembly. The pentamer is a sub-assembly. Those are both sub-assemblies of the virion. And the virion is then, of course, the final assembly. But this is, um, these are sub-assemblies. The difference, the distinction between, say, this and adenovirus is that this is just made from a precursor that's processed. It's the same idea for SV40 and adenovirus. You make individual proteins and you make bigger and bigger as assemblies, yeah, sub-assemblies. So the assembly line <coughs> is an important concept because it assures that the virions you make in the end are right, they're correct. You know, if you have a car going down an assembly line and uh, you miss the door, at some point someone notices it and I don't know how assembly lines for cars work, but won't reach the end of the line, okay? So it's the same idea with a viral <coughs> assembly line. And this is illustrated here for a bacteriophage. So this is a typical tailed bacteriophage that we've only briefly talked about in this course. It has an icosahedral head, a helical neck, and some tail fibers to help it attach to cells. And this illustrates how this is built by an assembly line process. So for example, the first thing you do is you make the head, the icosahedral head, by a number of proteins. All these are given different numbers here. 
gene numbers that are involved in them. And that would be made by the same sort of process that the polio capsid is made by. But that's not the entire virion. Uh, you have to make this neck, which is done by assembling the base plate and this tube in the middle and finally wrapping other proteins around it. And then only when this is properly made can it join with the icosahedral head. And in fact, it wouldn't even get to this point if it hadn't gone through each of these steps properly. Same thing with the icosahedral head. If something goes wrong, it's never going to join up with the neck. Uh, and even the tail fibers go through a series of assembly steps of various sorts. And again, they're sequential. If one doesn't happen, the next one doesn't happen after that. So only good fibers get joined up in the end. So this gives you an orderly process that assures some quality control, that the viruses you build, at least in terms of them fitting together, are right. You don't make a bad virus. You don't incorporate a bad neck, for example, because it doesn't reach the end of the, of the process. So let's talk about how a couple of other viruses are made. Um, and especially with bigger ones, it's not so easy to have spontaneously assembling capsids. And here's an example for uh, a herpes virus. Now you may remember that these viruses, they have large double-stranded DNA genomes and they replicate their genomes in the nucleus. And in fact, replication and putting the DNA into the capsid is tightly linked. So the assembly occurs in the nucleus as well. So all the proteins that you need to build the virion with, they get made in the cytoplasm. So here is the nuclear pore here. Cytoplasm is on the outside, on the left of this slide. And here in the middle, the main part of the slide is the nucleus. All the proteins that are going to be building this capsid, which you see here being assembled, have to be translated into cytoplasm. They're shipped into the nucleus, so each of them has a nuclear localization signal. You can see there are lots of them. There's pentamers and hexamers and triplexes and VP2421, et cetera. These get shipped in the nucleus, and they form what's called a procapsid. Now, this is a very large virion. 2,000 angstroms in diameter, something like that. So it doesn't assemble well on its own. It needs a chaperone, essentially. And it's, the chaperone is really in the form of a scaffold. So you can see on, in the middle here, as this procapsid is formed from pentamers and hexamers, there is a protein scaffold. So the protein scaffold assembles, and then the capsid forms around it. So this is like a scaffold on a building, which is typically on the outside. But this one is on the inside of the virus particle. Now, of course, you don't want the scaffold to remain because you need to put DNA inside there. And in a building, you just take the scaffold off the outside. But here, there's no way to get the scaffold out. So cleverly, one of the proteins that's part of the scaffold is actually a viral protease. And at some point in the assembly, it gets activated and digests away the scaffold. And what you're left with are remnants that don't matter. And then the genomic RNA, uh, sorry, the genomic DNA is put in uh, to this capsid and it goes in through the portal. Remember these virions have a single portal at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry. You can see it right there. It's called UL6 portal and the DNA is put in through that. We'll look at that process a bit later. So this is a very clever way to make a big capsid where you do need to have some support until it's fully assembled and can stand on its own and probably the DNA contributes to that stability. <clears throat> so this whole idea of sequential assembly is also part of adenoviruses assembly line. Here, this virus uh, doesn't need a internal scaffold, although it does need chaperones to assist in folding. We showed you an example of a, a viral chaperone that helped the hexon to trimerize. But here are the assembly steps of adenovirus in the nucleus. Remember, this is also a DNA-containing virus. <coughs> It replicates its DNA in the nucleus, and it also assembles the virions there as well. So all the structural proteins, again, get made in the cytoplasm, uh, the hexons, the pentons, the fibers, everything gets made in the cytoplasm. They get put into the nucleus, uh, and then they go through a series of steps to uh, form the virion. Now, we're not quite sure how adenovirus actually assembles. There are actually two models here. And this, this illustrates two general ways that assembly can proceed. So we've talked mainly about this sequential model for assembly, where you build things in a series of steps and make sure that they're all right, and then you, in the end you have a virion. So one model for adeno-assembly is that you sequentially <coughs> assemble first an empty capsid, 
uh, and then the DNA is threaded into it till you get uh, the virion, starts as a young virion, and then finally uh, it matures as the result of proteases to form the intact virion. So a, a series of assembly steps. You make a shell, you put the DNA in, then you mature it. There are a school of experimentalists who believe that this is not the way it happens, but rather the DNA and the proteins all come together at once. There's not a sequential series of events. And this is called concerted assembly because most of the assembly happens at one step. It's not a, it's not a series of uh, individual assembly steps. So which one is right, we don't know right now, but this does illustrate two ways that you can make a virus particle, sequential versus concerted. Now, just a few words on the need for chaperones versus um, the ability to fold and, and form a structure that's going to be in the virion on your own. So this we divide into self-assembly versus assisted. And we've already talked a little bit about this. There are many viral proteins that can assemble on their own. Uh, we've talked about the poliovirus protein, which as far as we know can assemble on, on its own. Who knows? Maybe a chaperone is needed and we simply haven't found it. Maybe they all need chaperones and we just don't know about them. But for now, we'll, we'll say some of them can self-assemble. Uh, and a couple more examples, uh, HIV, the capsid proteins, if you express them alone, they can form uh, empty shells. The influenza HA by itself, you just express the HA glycoprotein in cells, it will drive the formation of virus-like particles. And in fact, this is being done to make vaccines now, which have no nucleic acids in them. And finally, the HBV surface antigen, if you express that in cells, it makes virus-like particles. And in fact, that's the basis for the HBV vaccine. So these viral proteins have within them all the information, not only to fold properly, but to drive the formation uh, of a particle. And in contrast, there are a number of viral proteins that can assemble on their own. Uh, you sometimes need scaffolds, like we saw for uh, the herpes viruses, or you need chaperones to form the structure. And as I said, this may in <laughs> fact end up applying to even these instances. Uh, there may be chaperones that are involved that we just don't know about. So this is an example now of an, an, another way of assembly besides this sequential assembly. This is called concerted assembly where things more or less tend to happen all at once, although there are obviously some precursors that have to be made. This is the formation of influenza virus. And we may have looked at a slide like this before, but now we'll look at it in some detail. And remember, the influenza virions, the RNAs replicate in the nucleus. Uh, there they get wrapped up in the viral proteins that are eventually going to end up uh, in the virion particles. So we have genome replication. Uh, we have mRNA synthesis. The mRNAs have to go out in the cytoplasm, get translated, and then the proteins that are bound to associate with the viral RNA get shipped back into the nucleus by their import signals, of course. So now we have the formation here of a ribonucleoprotein. It's an RNA coated with four different kinds of viral proteins. That gets shipped out of the nucleus. It has an export signal, so it's recognized for export. It makes its way uh, to the plasma membrane. Now, meanwhile, in this infected cell, the viral glycoproteins are being made uh, by the secretory system. These are made on rough ER. These are ribosomes attached to the uh, ER translating viral mRNAs that encode HA, NA, and the M2 uh, ion channel. And these get shipped up to the plasma membrane where they form these little patches, right? Patches of HA, NA, and, and M2. And if you look at an infected cell early, you can see these patches. So the whole membrane is not covered with these viral glycoproteins. It happens in patches. You concentrate the material for faster assembly. So here you have a patch of HA, NA, and M2, and the ribonucleoprotein will find it. There are signals for the RNP to associate uh, with the membrane and, and also with the viral proteins. And at some point, this whole assembly buds out and forms a virion. So that's why we call this concerted assembly, because the virion is formed all at once. I mean, the protein, some of the components are formed in different steps, but they all come together to form a virion. So that's called the budding process. <clears throat> and of course, you can see how in this budding process, the virion gets its membrane, its lipid envelope from the host cell, and you can see how the viral glycoproteins get incorporated into it. So that's how a, an envelope virion is made, at least at the plasma membrane, and that's influenza virus. The driver, one of the main drivers of budding is the glycoprotein, which I said if you express on its own, 
will drive particle formation. So this is a schematic of the influenza hemagglutinin. Remember, it's one of the three proteins in the virion hemagglutinin neuraminidase and the M2 ion channel there. So here's the HA shown in a linear form. It's a glycoprotein. It is membrane bound, as you can see. It has a lot of sugars attached to it. These are the sugars, these Ys. It has disulfide bonds. Of course, it has a signal sequence because it's translated into the ER. There's the fusion peptide, which you remember uh, remains near the membrane until it's ready to fuse. It is released by cleavage to make the end terminus free right there, and it's kept by the membrane and then pops up uh, when the pH drops. So this is one of the viral glycoproteins that is brought through the secretory pathway to uh, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. <clears throat> As viral glycoproteins pass through the secretory pathway, they get, they are subject to many of the modifications that any other protein would be subject to. So here's just a schematic of uh, the typical secretory pathway movement from the endoplasmic reticulum all the way up to the plasma membrane. We're actually looking at the production and movement of the HA of influenza virus. So again, it's translated on rough ER. It has a signal sequence, which you, gets it into the ER in the first place, and that, that's, of course, cleaved off to free the end terminus of the HA. And then the molecule moves through the pathway, through the Golgi network, uh, all the way to the plasma membrane. And as it moves through, various modifications happen. The protein oligomerizes, sugars get added and taken off, and finally the HA gets cleaved in some cases uh, so that it is produced as a cleaved polypeptide, as, you sh as shown here, and will be active then uh, in, uh, in new infections. So here's the, the mature HA. It's a transmembrane with a cleaved HA here, uh, and the fusion peptide buried down by the membrane. And curiously, the part of the viral protein on the inside of the virion is, has a bit of lipid bound to it. That's the yellow stick there, and that makes it stick in the membrane. And why, it's, why that is is not really understood, but apparently it's important. So another example of concerted assembly formation of retrovirus particles. There's a few differences here I want to point out to you. These also form by budding. <coughs> but they mature after release. Remember, influenza particle was mature as it was budding out, but these mature afterwards. So that's what I want to show you. Now remember, retroviruses, uh, their mRNAs are produced from transcription of the provirus. The provirus, of course, being the integrated DNA copy in the nucleus. The mRNAs are produced, they get shipped out into the cytoplasm, and some of them get translated, of course, into various proteins. Uh, here, for example, is the structural precursor. It's made as a polyprotein. And remember, to get the enzyme reverse transcriptase and integrase, you need to have some kind of anti-termination event, either frame shifting or suppression, to get a little bit of the RT made. So mostly you get structural proteins. Uh, and those will associate uh, with the RNA genome uh, they will go to the plasma membrane where the viral glycoproteins have been inserted, just like they would be for influenza virus. You can see here the transmembrane glycoprotein is in the plasma membrane. Uh, the, the matrix protein, which will form that shell just under the membrane, assembles there. You can see it's, it's put up as a very nice uh, precursor matrix. Capsid will form the actual shell of the virion. And then nucleocapsid protein, the white one here, is what actually binds the RNA. So you can see the nucleocapsid binds the RNA genome, and this whole assembly, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid, then goes up uh, to the plasma membrane where it starts to form a shell. And you have a bunch of these lining up here, okay, RNA, proteins, and then you have a little bit of production of the polymerase precursor, which gets also incorporated. So the reverse transcriptase is the blue one here. Uh, the integrase is purple. So you can see a few of those get incorporated into the virion as well, because they're part of this polyprotein. See the matrix, capsid, NC, protease, RT, integrase, that can go up there as well. This whole assembly buds, but it's not finished yet. It's not a mature virion. This, you can see, looks different from the final virion. Here, there are some proteases incorporated into the particle. Those are the yellow molecules. And after the virion is formed, those proteases act and mature the capsid. So now you have that um, icosahedral-based capsid in the interior forming. 
Okay, so that's an example of maturing uh, after release. Otherwise, it's a similar process of influenza virus, a concerted form of assembly uh, by budding. And the, the glycoprotein of the retrovirus is illustrated here. It's very similar to uh, that of the HA. It's a transmembrane glycoprotein, so it's produced in the ER. It moves through the Golgi. It gets glycosylated. As you can see here, uh, the signal peptide, of course, is released. There's an internal fusion protein which is liberated by cleavage at these orange circles and it folds properly in the ER Golgi to look like this. So on the surface of the virion, it, it looks like this. Here's the fusion peptide bent close to the membrane so it won't randomly fuse with any membrane. The SU is the attachment protein and we talked about how this works when it binds receptors and leads to fusion at the plasma membrane. Now some of these proteins get modified with lipids as another way of telling them where to go in the cell. So we've talked about signal sequences that bring proteins through the secretory pathway, but there can be lipid modifications occurring as well, and these typically target proteins to membranes of different sorts. Here I'm showing you three different kinds of lipid, uh, myristate and farnesol being attached to a protein and also geranol, geranol, and palmitate. These are just different lipids that can be covalently linked to viral proteins. Okay, and they get modified typically to point them to membranes. So it's another way of addressing where a viral protein is going to go by putting lipid uh, onto it. So here, for example, is what lipid modification does during retrovirus assembly. This is the pathway we just talked about and I was telling you how this capsid precursor gets to the plasma membrane and brings all the proteins and RNA with it. Well, it doesn't just magically go there. The matrix protein at its end terminus is modified with a lipid. It happens to be meristate, but the point is this lipid is covalently linked. It makes <laughs> the end terminus hydrophobic, and that's what directs the precursor with the RNA attached to it to the plasma membrane. If you mutate, the amino acid to which myristate is attached, so that myristate can no longer be attached, you will not get production of virus particles. So this myristate is essential for particle formation. And again, because it helps target uh, the um, matrix program protein, the first part of this polyprotein, to the plasma membrane. Now, also part of this precursor is the capsid, which forms, of course, the icosahedral capsid beneath the M protein. And you can see nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is the protein that binds RNA. It's what latches onto the viral RNA and brings it up to the plasma membrane along with the structural proteins. So you can see it's a very orderly process. And that viral RNA, uh, the, sorry, that nucleocapsid has very specific RNA binding sequences within it. You can see them right here that allow viral RNA to bind to it and nothing else. You don't want to bring cellular mRNAs into these virions. That would be a waste. So there's a specific um, signal for incorporating these viral RNAs. And that brings us to genome packaging. You don't want to put cellular genomes into your virus particles. Often the cellular genomes or the mRNAs or DNAs are in vast excess. So there has to be a way to distinguishing them wherever the assembly is occurring. And remember, there's no way really to distinguish between RNA and DNA, whether it's viral or uh, host unless you have a specific signal because DNA is DNA and uh, RNA is RNA. For example, retrovirus genomes are less than 1% of the total cytoplasmic RNA, yet they're the only RNAs that end up in particles, majority of, uh, anyway. And this is a reflection of the fact that these genomes, these viruses don't replicate. Remember, they depend on Paul II to make transcripts in the nucleus so that they can be encapsidated. So there's not a lot of viral RNA, yet that's what gets specifically packaged. And that's because for many viruses, there are packaging signals in the genome. And that's exactly what the word says. It is a signal saying, I need to get to a capsid protein to be incorporated into a particle. And these have been found in many viral genomes not in all, though, and maybe the ones where we haven't found them have other mechanisms of packaging, but I want to tell you about this one first. So the way you identify a packaging sequence, or one way that you can identify a packaging sequence, is to make mutations 
in the genome and then ask what, under what conditions in an infection <coughs> with this mutant genome do we get particles and nucleic acids but the two don't come together. We never make an infectious virion. So here are two examples of how this has been done. Here is adenovirus. And remember, adenovirus has a pretty long uh, double-stranded DNA genome, and we're showing that here. And here's the left end, the origin of replication, all the way at the left end, remember. And the packaging sequences are shown here in blue arrows. You see they're near the left end. They're quite near within a few hundred bases of the origin of replication. They overlap with the uh, enhancer, which you've heard about from Dr. Silverstein, which helps uh, to initiate transcription. And these are simply overlapping sequences whose presence are necessary for this DNA to be incorporated into the adenovirus capsid. If you make changes in these sequences, you decrease or abolish that ability. So these are packaging sequences. You take them out or you take this whole chunk of DNA out, you will affect the ability of this DNA to get into the capsid. And then at the bottom uh, is the same sort of sequence for SV40, the smaller uh, double-stranded circular DNA genome. Uh, here is the enhancer of SV40, the origin of replication in the early transcription unit. And you can see the packaging signal is right here in this uh, region uh, around these transcription factor binding sites. So again, these sequences, if you change them, the viral DNA doesn't get into the capsid. So these are packaging sequences. And if the virus doesn't have these, it won't get packaged. And this is why cellular nucleic acids don't get packaged, because they don't have these uh, sequences. In some cases, you can transfer these sequences to, say, other DNAs and get those DNAs packaged. Herpes virus genomes also have packaging sequences. And they are located at the left end of the long double-stranded DNA genome. So here on the top is the entire genome. We're expanding the left end at the bottom here. And the packaging sequences are called PAC1 and PAC2. Uh, they are part of an element called the A element at the very left end. And you can see that A element repeated uh, here at the end of the UL region and then finally at the other end of the genome. And these two packaging sequences uh, are needed for this viral DNA to get into a virion. The way that works is shown on the right. Now you may remember that the genome replicates as a rolling circle and makes head to tail concatamers, very long unit length molecules of the genome. And that's the substrate for encapsidation. So here uh, is a concatamer of, of genomes shown bound to the portal on the herpes capsid. Remember, there's one portal on the capsid. It's the way that the DNA can get in. And the portal binds the genome. This is actually part of the termination process of DNA replication. This is a, a termination assembly of proteins here. And within it are the packaging sequences. You can see PAC1 here. So this specific part of the genome acts, uh, interacts with the portal together with these sequences. And then the DNA gets pulled into the capsid. There is a motor activity in this portal that pulls, winds the DNA in, if you will. You can see that happening here. The head is filling up with, with viral DNA. And then there are two signals that tell the packaging process that it should stop and go no further. One is when you have a head full of DNA. That is, you have a, a, a unit length genome. And that can be uh, discerned by uh, going from one A repeat to the other. And the other is that you have now uh, these packaging sequences in opposition here. So a head full and both packaging sequences are located here. And then that signals an endonuclease to cleave uh, the DNA. And now you have a single genome in the head. So you have a full length genome signaled by not only a head full, but also the two packaging sequences. So that prevents you from cleaving the DNA here. You have to wait till the head is full with the entire genome, and then you have another set of packaging sequences uh, down at the other end. So it's an interesting combination of mechanisms, <coughs> including the packaging sequence. So those are two DNA genome examples. Uh, let's look at how RNA viruses package their genomes. And these are examples from the retroviruses. Um, on the left for, is an example of the HIV uh, packaging signal. And let's start down here at the lower left. This is the left end of the viral RNA genome. And you may remember the primer binding site. That's where the tRNA is binding to initiate reverse transcriptase. 
Uh, the packaging sequence is shown here. It's called psi. The Greek symbol psi indicates the packaging sequence. And you can see that um, it's a highly structured area with several stem loop SL structures here. And what's thought to happen is, remember that every retrovirus virion has two, two RNA genomes in it. Well, in the case of HIV, what's thought is you form a, what's called a kissing loop complex. These two stem loops of adjacent RNAs interact in this way. They base pair uh, and they form a complex, which is then the substrate for packaging. We'll see how that works in a minute. And this is important, but there are other signals in the genome as well that are needed for genome packaging. So this sequence alone will not suffice. On the right are some other retroviral packaging signals. Here is uh, Maloney murine leukemia virus. Uh, this is a rather simple packaging sequence. The size sequence is right there. You can take that short RNA sequence and put it, put it into other mRNAs and they will get packaged. So this is necessary and sufficient for packaging. Now this is interesting because um, you re may remember that in addition to the full length viral mRNA, there is a spliced product in some retroviruses and that goes, that removes this sequence from here to here and that allows you to translate the envelope like a protein, the very last uh, protein coded in the genome. Envelope messenger RNAs are never packaged in, ret in Maloney retrovirus virions and that's because the splice removes the packaging sequence. So that's a neat way to just get full length genomes into the virion because those are the only ones that have uh, the splicing signal. Unfortunately that doesn't apply for all retroviruses. Here is one where the splice, uh, the psi signal is upstream of the five prime splice site. Okay, so this is also necessary and sufficient for splicing but in fact envelope messages don't get packaged. So there's something else that is uh, regulating that as well. So. Uh, this is a cool example of excluding envelope from uh, the, the virion, but this is not. The biology is not always neat. You know, there are always exceptions to uh, every rule. So let's go back and look at the HIV uh, packaging scheme. Remember this kissing loop. You have two RNAs in the, G in the virion, and they're going to interact. So if you have just one RNA, we'll, we'll show this as two stem loop structures. And the protein that binds the RNA that gets the RNA into the virion is the nucleocapsid protein, NC. And the monomeric RNA, just one RNA molecule, will not bind NC protein. But when you have two in a virion, they then interact. So these are now two RNA molecules forming these kissing interactions. So here is one in yellow coming around there. And then the second molecule is green. You can see the green is base pairing with the yellow. So the two molecules are base pairing. And this base pairing exposes um, sequences which can then bind NC. And these are these uh, red and yellow sequences with the exposed bases, if you will. These are contacts for the protein. Now NC can bind um, this RNA. And that can then get incorporated into the virion. Remember, NC is part of that precursor, the matrix capsid NC precursor that binds to the plasma membrane. So this is how NC binds the RNA. It brings it up to the plasma membrane. Do I have a slide? No, I don't have a slide of that. But you, if you go back a few and look at that, when these particles are getting ready to bud, you have the viral proteins assembling at the membrane with the RNA bound to the NC. And this is how NC binds the mm -hmm. RNA. So then NC in turn is part of the gag precursor that gets uh, assembled into budding particles. And then all of that is cleaved by the protease. And that's what causes mm -hmm the final uh, maturation. Um, it's not so straightforward for other viral RNAs. <clears throat> uh, poliovirus, for example, doesn't seem to have a packaging signal. No one has been able to identify one anyway. And we don't know what allows for specific packaging because these virus particles do not incorporate any cellular mRNA, so there may be the, the polymerase itself is a determinant of packaging. As polymerase replicates the molecule, maybe those are molecules that are getting packaged. This is something that remains to be sorted out. Now, in general, when you have an icosahedral particle, you are limited as to how much extra nucleic acid you can put in. 
And so if you want to do gene vectoring in viruses, the icosahedral particles, you can only put 5 or 10% more than the genome in. The, the envelope viruses have more flexibility because they can grow. In fact, these vesicular st stomatitis viruses, rabies-like viruses, can get quite long as you put more and more uh, DNA in them. They're not unlimited, but you can generally fit more in. Now, how about a segmented genome? This is a very interesting problem. If you have a virus with, you know, three or eight or 10 or 12 segments, how do you make sure that every particle gets the right number of segments? Not only the right number, but the right ones, eight unique segments or 10 unique segments or whatever. So there are two models. There are random and specific models. And so for example, and they're hard to distinguish. So flu, for example, has eight segments. And if you say there's just random packaging of any eight RNAs, in fact, that would give you one infectious particle for every 400 assembles. So remember, you have a pool of RNAs in the cell. If you just say, I'm going to grab any eight, that would give you one out of 400 infectious <coughs> particles, which turns out to be about what the particle to PFU ratio is for this virus. Remember, that's how many defective uh, infectious particles you make per total number of particles. If you had 12 segments, which some viruses do, 10% of the particles would have the complete viral genome. So it's, there's a school of thought which says a lot of these uh, viruses with segmented genomes simply grab the right number of segments and, and go from there. But there is some evidence for specific packaging, and this came, has come up recently for influenza virus. And um, this is based on the fact that if you do electron micrographs of influenza particles, you see uh, quite a regular arrangement of segments within each virion. So at the bottom here, each of these spherical uh, objects is a virion, of course. You can see the glycoproteins on the outside. And inside, you can, say, you can see a very specific arrangement of the eight segments. So here's a model on top of how this looks. So it looks like the eight segments are lined up in parallel form in each virion. And there's some evidence that uh, there are se sequences on the ends of each RNA that specify this. So there could be signals on each genome that tell it to go into a particle so that you don't have to be uh, depending on a random mechanism of packaging. There is uh, one virus that I know of that does selective packaging, which is quite interesting. And this is a bacteriophage called Phi6. And this is a bacteriophage that has three double-stranded RNA segments in its genome. It's an icosahedral uh, virion, as you can see here, uh, with an envelope. And it has three segments. And those, those go in in order. The first segment to go in is the S, the smallest segment. Apparently, there's some interaction between that segment and the protein shell. And then only when S is in there does M go in. So M entry depends on S. And then finally, if L wants to go in, uh, S, this should be M here. A L depends on the presence of S and M. Okay, so you have a sequential packaging mechanism which depends on each of the previous segments being there. And maybe that's why this virus has a particle to PFU ratio of one. So that means that every particle that a cell makes is infectious, which is really Remarkable. There are not a lot of viruses that are like this, and it may be that serial dependence of packaging uh, accounts for this rather than randomly selecting. Uh, finally, let's talk a little bit about how you get an envelope. And as I said, um, there, this can follow the assembly of internal structures, like flu the, is the example we talked about, and that, that's how it happens for most viruses. Or it can uh, happen at, uh, simultaneously with assembly of internal structures like retroviruses. And there are a number of ways that viruses can bud. In some cases, uh, the, the glycoprotein and the capsid proteins drive budding, so you have to express both of them. Uh, in some cases, the internal proteins are enough. You express a matrix protein of some viruses, and that will form a bud. In some cases, the envelope proteins alone. So we talked about uh, hepatitis B virus or influenza virus. You just express the envelope. That's enough to get a particle. And then finally, there are some cases where you need a combination of internal and glycoproteins to, to form a bud. And these are all, uh, this is kind of an example of the wide range of complexities that there are in formation of these envelope particles. So remember, this is influenza virus. This is an example of when uh, you form the virion at the very end. You form an internal structure first uh, in the cytoplasm. 
that goes to the plasma membrane, and then you have formation of a bud. And that is driven, again, only by the HA, although, of course, you want to incorporate uh, the RNA as well. These uh, viral proteins that drive budding go to the membrane, again, by specific signals. Uh, so the, the M protein is located here attached uh, to the viral RNA. That is driven to the membrane by very specific hydrophobic regions. As you can see here for influenza virus, uh, the same for VSV. There are very specific sequences that drive membrane binding. If you change them by mutating the sequence, you, you abolish particle formation because the M proteins uh, cannot go to the plasma membrane. <clears throat> Here, and this brings us back to retroviruses. Uh, and remember, the retroviruses are assembled as these precursors pick up RNA, and the matrix protein has a meristate at the end terminus that targets it to the membrane. In fact, if you express just GAG uh, alone, the GAG protein, you will form particles. You don't need to have RNA to form particles. So just this, pro actually this protein right here, GAG, if you express that only in cell, you will form particles. So that's an example of a, of a protein, of a virus where you don't need the glycoproteins. Just these underlying proteins will drive budding. Now, a number of years ago, a, a sequences were discovered in a variety of viral glycoproteins uh, by altering them by mutagenesis, and they were called L or late domains. And these were initially found in retroviruses. They were amino acid change, changes in that GAG structural protein that caused arrest of budding. So here's an example of the phenotype. These virions would start to bud out, but most of them would never come off, and they would remain attached uh, by a stalk. So this, was, this sequence where these changes were initially introduced into these late domains were eventually found in many different enveloped viruses, plus or minus strand RNA. So these are sequences that are essential to complete the budding process. And it turns out that these L domains, these late domains, bind uh, cellular proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. So viruses have usurped another step in the cell, and that is to form uh, buds like this. And here are some L domain motifs. They're shown here by a, uh, an oval or a uh, polyhedral type structure. And they're just, just to show you that they're found in a variety of retroviral genomes. There are in Ebola viruses, uh, rhabdoviruses, arenaviruses. So all of these viral glycoproteins have these sequences which allow them to interact with the cellular membrane fusion machinery. And these are very specific sequences. You can see them here. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they are essential for the budding process. Now this cell system that the virus is interacting with is called the escort system. It's the escort machinery. And the escort machinery is an important component of processes in the cell that require uh, things to occur that sort of resemble budding of virus particles. So for example, uh, within the cell, there are structures called multivesicular bodies. And these are large membranous structures which then contain smaller vesicles that bud into them. So this is sort of the reverse of a virus budding from the plasma membrane. But these, these bud into the cells. These are part of the normal processes of the cell. And the escort proteins, which are shown here as, uh, at one of these budding ves uh, invaginating vesicles, these escort <coughs> proteins drive this process. So again, the virus has usurped this escort machinery in order to bud from the cell. Also in cell division, escort proteins are involved as well. So the retroviruses and other envelope viruses have grabbed this escort machinery. And they do so by interacting with the GAG protein or with some structural protein of the virion. And instead of this process normally invaginating a, a vesicle into the cell, the virus has now tricked it into making a bud. And so that's how. Uh, the virus actually forms the bud through this escort system. It's very clever. Uh, viruses can bud in many cellular compartments. Uh, we have talked about um, budding from the plasma membrane, uh, but some viruses can bud from the Golgi and from the ER as well. And here are examples of various uh, viral glycoproteins uh, being produced in those different compartments. Uh, here's an example of what herpes virus does. It probably takes the budding to the extreme. So the particle, remember, is formed in the nucleus. Remember, the DNA is taken up into the capsid, uh, 
It then buds out of the nucleus. It buds out of the nucleus, doesn't go through the pore, and acquires a membrane, so it finds itself in the ER. So now we have a capsid with a single membrane. To get out of the ER, it fuses with the ER membrane, and now in the cytoplasm is this naked viral capsid again. Still has a ways to go. It buds into the trans-Golgi network and acquires a membrane there, and then it buds out of the trans-Golgi and acquires a second membrane, and then finally that second membrane fuses at the cell surface, at the plasma membrane, to release the virion, which has the right number of membranes, one. Right? And that one was, of course, derived from the Golgi, because that's where it acquired it. This was just an extra one to get it to the cell surface, so kind of an extreme version. Uh, just at the end here, I want to talk about how viruses get out of cells. Um, we talked about budding. That's, of course, one way of a virus to get out of a cell. Many viruses lyse the cell. They break them open and they come spilling out. And other viruses don't ever break cells open. They can move from cell to cell or they exit uh, without cell lysis. Here's an example of an HIV-infected T cell which is releasing virions by budding. And curiously, uh, these are being released in a very specific part of the cell. Only one of the domains of the plasma membrane is releasing virions. Nothing else. Remember, the whole cell is infected, but the, the budding process is, di is directed towards one portion, a very specific use of, of concentrating viral components. Uh, the, the, the leaving of particles from cells is very controlled. <laughs> It, viruses can, when cells in us are polarized typically, they have apical and basal lateral domains. Viruses can leave at the top, they can leave through the sides of the cells, the lateral domains of the cells, they can do both. And some viruses will bud from beneath the cells or be released from beneath the cells. And this is very important for pathogenesis, and this is something that we will get back to later. How, where a virus is released controls the kind of disease that it's going to cause. Here's another example of polarized release of virus. Here's an axon which is infected with a herpes virus, and we can tell that by the staining because the virus uh, is encoding a fluorescent protein. And uh, you can see that the virus is being released at the axon terminus, and these epithelial cells in turn are being infected. So a very specific directed release of virus uh, from this type of cell. Cells lice for a variety of reasons after virus infection. Uh, the virus can inhibit all sorts of cellular processes that cause it to lice. The apoptosis uh, can be induced. And there are also some virus-specific mechanisms. There's viral proteases that uh, mess up the cells so that they begin to lyse, glycoproteins, and general damage of the cell. So, when we think about pathogenesis, which is what we're going to do from this point on, this is going to be part of the component of, of viruses causing disease, how they uh, lyse the cells. Now, as I said before, not all viruses lyse cells. And if they're not a budding virus, then we have to figure out how they get out of the cell. So here's one example of that. There's some evidence that well, poliovirus in general lyses the cells that it infects. But there's some evidence that there's also some release of virus in the absence of lysis. And this is one mechanism by which this is thought to occur. When poliovirus and related viruses infect cells, the cells respond by uh, inducing the autophagy pathway. They begin to form uh, vesicles, double membrane vesicles that encompass the cytoplasm. The virus actually takes advantage of this uh, by replicating its genome on the surface. These are the vesicles that the virus replicates its RNA genome on. Uh, but the virus also antagonizes the fusion of these autophagosomes with lysosomes, which happens late in, in this uh, pathway. And actually, these, these vesicles end up capturing virus particles and bringing them to the cell surface and releasing them. So normally, the autophagy pathway captures the cytoplasm, digests it, and then brings it and throws it out the idea, I guess, being that it's recycling cells that are going to be killed anyway, so you might as well give up your amino acids for other cells. But polio interdicts, it blocks lysosome fusion, and has its virions come out at the cell surface. Pretty clever use of autophagy, both for replicating your genome and for um, bringing your particles outside. 
The last thing I want to show you is this cool virus, Ascidianus convivitor virus. This is a virus of archaea, you know, these, this third kingdom of life. And uh, this was, virus was found in a hot acidic spring in Italy, pH 1 and a half, 85 to 93 degrees centigrade. Play, good place to take a field trip, right? Go collect viruses. Anyway, this virus, when it's mature, it's, it looks like this, really unusual. It's got a lemon-shaped uh, body and it, these, these tails on either side. When these viruses are released from cells, and the host is archaea again, looks like this on the right. It doesn't have any tails. And then it matures extracellularly, <coughs> and these tails grow. So what's going on here? Well, there must be precursor proteins that are doing this, because I don't believe that any translation is happening in this virion. Remember, because virions don't encode the translation apparatus. So this is kind of an extreme example of maturation of a particle outside of the cell. We talked about how retroviruses do this. They mature outside of the cell, but in comparison, this is pretty extreme. All right, so now we have gone through an infectious cycle. And if you stopped learning virology at this point, you would have no clue about how viruses cause disease because a lot of what we told you doesn't really help explain that. So that's what we'll do for the rest of the course. Going to help you figure out how viruses make you sick.